We are jumping into this series, and the name is appropriate, The Art of Being Unordinary. We're going to look at something that is more art than science. It's not a formula. Please hear me. This is not input equals output. If you've ever looked at art, studied art, admired art, what, one thing you can understand, whatever uh, art form you're looking at, it is something that you are not immediately great at. It's something that if you continue to practice, apply, work on over time, if you're consistent, eventually you can produce a masterpiece. You can produce something that is unequal, it's different than anything else that you've ever created, that you've made, that you've designed, whatever the case might be, but it's not based on find the formula, two plus two equals four. And it's not always a guarantee. In other words, you may work on something for a long time, and when you look at it, you go, this isn't exactly what I wanted, but keep trying, keep working on it. So the art of becoming unordinary, living a life that's beyond the ordinary, is not something that's going to happen when you try this once. We're going to be talking about this over the next five weeks, and some of you will say, I tried it, and it didn't work. Keep trying. This is a lifetime to become a master of this, to break out of that mold of the ordinary. And what we're going to look at is an ordinary life and an unordinary life are separated by our choices, our behaviors, our actions, our attitudes. So much of our culture today di di dismisses and tends to diminish the whole idea of personal responsibility. My life is hard because I got a bad break. My life is difficult because I didn't have the opportunities. It's their fault. I got dealt a bad hand. I was never given the break. Whatever the case might be, now please hear me. Please hear me. Please hear me. I understand. I am clearly aware that we do not all start at the same place. Everyone has a different starting point. But where your life, not everyone else's life, where your life ends up is based on a continuing series of choices, actions, attitudes, and behaviors, and it will separate an ordinary life from an unordinary life. And so if you want to master the art of being unordinary, you have to stop embracing the attitudes, actions, and behaviors of the past and begin to embrace new ones. So throughout this series, we're going to look at five characters from the Bible, five unique individuals, men and women, who were unordinary who broke out of the mold of the ordinary, of the ordinary and we're going to see what action, what behavior, what choice, what attitude is it that defined them and helped them to experience this unordinary life. So we're going to start with a man named Solomon. So let me give you a little background in case you're not familiar. Solomon was the son of a king. His dad's name was David, King David. The same David you may have heard of David and Goliath. The same David who killed the giant. The same David who then became the second king of Israel, but the, the most renowned king. In other words, he, his, his fame was boundless. David was a genius in so many ways. David was a military genius. He, he had an understanding of, of military uh, approach. He was a tactician, but he was also a spiritual leader. He was the de facto spiritual leader of Israel. Most of the Psalms were written by David. David's called a man after God's own heart. He had an intimate, close relationship with God and how David went set the spiritual pace for the rest of the nation. David was a savvy political leader. David was all these things and here's Solomon, a young man 
who, when David gets ready to die, says, Solomon's to uh, be my successor. He is going to follow me as the king. And then David dies. And Solomon says, my daddy left big feet print. And how am I going to follow in his footsteps? My daddy cast a big shadow, and I have to live in this shadow. He felt inadequate. He felt the weight and the pressure of following his father as king of Israel. And shortly after his coronation, he's, he's set in, coronated. I mean, he, everyone says, he is our now, he's our king. We accept Solomon. God shows up in a dream, and it's a defining moment in Solomon's life. And we find it uh, in, two se- in two separate places, first uh, in 2 Kings and also here in Chronicles. And it says this, that night, God appeared to Solomon and said to him, ask For whatever you want me to give you, give me wisdom and knowledge that I may lead this people. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? He acknowledges this is God's people, not his. God said to Solomon, since this is your heart's desire and you have not asked for wealth, for possessions, for honor, nor for the death of your enemies. And since you have not asked for a long life. But instead you ask for wisdom and knowledge to govern my people over whom I have made you king. Therefore, wisdom and knowledge will be given you. And I will also give you wealth and possessions and honor such as no king was before and no king after you will be. God says, Solomon... You can ask me anything. And Solomon chooses wisdom. And what we see is it sets him apart. There'll be no king like you before or after. There's been a lot of kings throughout human history. Very few of them, you can say their name and people say, I've heard of that guy. But Solomon is one of them. Solomon chose wisdom and God said, I'm going to give you an unordinary life as a result. And Solomon's wisdom was amazing. Solomon all of a sudden had the ability to start great building projects. He understood, and and some of the building projects, one of them was a great temple of Jerusalem. He also established a seaport, which brought in a huge amount of wealth. He made strategic, economic, and military alliances with other nations. People from all over, sovereigns from all over the world came to be in Solomon's presence, to hear his wisdom. He wrote three books, or the major portions of three books of the Bible. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. He he was an amazing man because he chose wisdom. Now, I'm thinking, maybe you think like this. I'd like to think that if God showed up and asked me and said to me, ask me anything, that I would have done what Solomon did. Give me wisdom. (laughs) But I'm just lying to myself. I, I probably would have been all those things that God said, since you didn't ask for wealth, possessions, fame, power, the long life, the death of your enemies. I could probably ask for any of those before I would have thought of wisdom. I'd have thought of something for my family. I'd have saw, thought of something. But wisdom ought to be what leaps to our thoughts. I don't know what would have leapt, leapt to your thoughts. I don't know if wisdom would have leapt to mine. But it ought to. Why? Because wisdom lays at the heart of an unordinary life. If we can't learn to have wisdom, we'll never have the unordinary life that we can. Because without that, we end up stuck in regret. We end up stuck in a life that seems monotonous. So right now, just think of some of your greatest regrets. Just think of them. You don't have to tell anyone. And if you're married, please don't look at your spouse and say... (laughs) If your kids are here with you, say... We love you. Uh, No, uh, just think, what what are some of your greatest regrets? What are they? A a relationship you wish you had not had, a decision you wish you had not made, a direction you wish you had not gone, whatever it is. Now, if you had had wisdom, if you had had the wisdom of Solomon, would you have made a different choice? Could you have avoided some of that regret? Would your life look different Going back, making that decision again, if you had more wisdom. If you want an unordinary life, you need to choose wisdom every time, every time, every time. 
And the reason that we tend not to embrace wisdom is because we tend to want to make an emotional decision. We tend to want to decide and choose what's easy, what's convenient, what feels good, what, what removes as much obstacle, tension, or frustration as we can. I will choose this. I'll choose to avoid conflict. I'll choose what makes me feel good. I'll choose what elicits an emotional response in me. I'll choose what makes the person that I live with not get angry. And so we make a choice that's not wise because we make an emotional choice. And if we want to live an unordinary life, we need to learn to make a choice based on wisdom. And here's part of the struggle. So often, so often, so often, most of the choices that we make in life, you cannot find a clear biblical directive. The Bible is clear on many, many things. It's not clear on who you should marry. There's principles, but it doesn't say, go marry Bob Smith. Or Sister Sally, it, it doesn't tell you those things. It doesn't say, take the job at this company. It doesn't tell you, go to this school, have this major. It doesn't tell you any of those things. So we have to make choices based on wisdom. It's why we need the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, who is the Spirit of wisdom, to lead us, to guide us, to direct us so that we can avoid an ordinary life, a life of regret, a life of disappointment, a life of frustration, and instead live the unordinary life that God has for us. So how do we find this wisdom? The first thing, and this is it's so obvious we miss it. So here it is. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God. Solomon asked God. God said, ask me anything you want. Solomon said, I want wisdom and understanding. I want wisdom and understanding. So ask God. If God will give it to Solomon, he'll give it to you. Ask God for wisdom for yourself. Ask God for wisdom for other people. Parents, pray for wisdom for your children when they're young, when they're teenagers, when they're young adults, when they're old adults. Pray for wisdom for your grandchildren, for your, if you're a teacher, for your students, if you're a coach, for the athletes, if you're a, a, a manager, if you're an employer, for your employees. Pray for wisdom for others. But ask God. Here's what it says in the book of James. <clears throat> it says, if any one of you lacks wisdom, if you don't have wisdom, if you need wisdom, you should ask God. Everyone say, ask God. If you're online, put in the chat, ask God. The reason we sometimes fail to have wisdom is because we don't ask God for wisdom. We think, I can figure it out on my own. And then when it fails, then when it doesn't work, when we have no other options, what do we say? Now, I'll ask God. Oh God, get me out of this mess I made. Get me out of, I made a, a mess of things. I wish I had had wisdom. Why didn't you ask? Ask God. Ask God for wisdom. God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. In other words, don't say, I can't ask God for wisdom because he's not going to give it to me. He knows I'm a mess up. He knows I'm a screw up. He knows what I've done. He knows what I've said. He knows that I don't read the Bible enough, and I don't do all the things that I'm supposed to do and that he would want me to do. So I'm not going to ask him for wisdom. The reason it says he gives generously without finding fault is that it doesn't matter where you have started from. If you ask God for wisdom, he will give it to you. So ask God. Say God. And then, like I said, ask, ask God for wisdom for other people. Please, I'm... I'm asking you as your pastor, pray for wisdom for your pastor every day because I need it. Oh, Lord knows I need it. Uh, but we all need it. Pray for wisdom for those above you, for those below you, for those alongside of you. Pray for wisdom. Here's what it says in the book of Ephesians. Paul's writing. And he says, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, will give you what? A spirit of wisdom. So pray. That's kind of Here's one of the things I pray for myself and I pray for my children almost every day. Oftentimes when my kids were, were little and even now when I pray with them before they go to bed, I'll pray this over them, but I'll pray it even when I don't pray for them at night. I say, God, give them the wisdom to know what's right and the courage to do what's right, even if it's hard, even if it's difficult. I pray that for myself. God, give me the wisdom to know what's right and the courage to do what's right, even when it's hard. Even when the easiest thing is to fudge a number on the tax return, 
Give me the wisdom to know what's right and the courage to do it even when it's hard. Even when the easy thing to do is just to make up a little story or, or do something that would, would end up jeopardizing my life or my ministry or my family. Give me the wisdom to know what's right and then the courage to walk it out and to do it even when it's hard. So ask God for wisdom. Ask God, if you want an unordinary life, ask God for wisdom. The next thing is this. Seek wisdom. Okay, you've asked God. Wonderful. Okay, God, give me wisdom. He says, I'll give you wisdom. And then we don't do anything to, to grow, to develop the wisdom that he's given us. So seek wisdom. There, there are in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there are five books called the books of wisdom. Solomon, um, the Song of Solomon, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. So read those. Here's, here's something you can do. The book of Proverbs has 31 chapters. So every month that has 31 days, read a chapter of Proverbs. On the months that don't have 31 days, read through one of the other uh, books of wisdom. But study wisdom. Be a student of wisdom. Find ways to grow in wisdom. Because if you want to be a wise person and live an unordinary life, yes, ask God for wisdom, but he's also given us a deep well from which to draw. And if you won't say, now I'm going to learn, I'm going to study, I'm going to dig into this, I am going to find wisdom. You will see that God says, I've given you wisdom. Here's five books of wisdom. Yeah, but I, I need supernatural wisdom. He says, this is a supernaturally divine inspired word. Read that. So here's what it says in the book of Ecclesiastes. It says, I turn. So this is Solomon's writing. He says, I turn my mind to understand, to investigate, and to search out wisdom. Search out, seek, study, find wisdom. So that when the moment of a decision comes, you've already got an arsenal, you've already got a, 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 a way in which you say, I, I, I can discern, I can divine, I can understand what the wise thing to do is because I've studied this, I've asked God for it, and I've filled my tank up with this stuff. Another part of seeking wisdom is this. Seeking wisdom means seeking wise counsel. Seeking wisdom means seeking wise counsel. Seeking wisdom means seeking wise counsel. You and I are not smart enough to know everything. If we were, we wouldn't need wisdom. So we need wisdom. Sometimes you're going to think you know it, and you won't. So ask other people. The, the, it... it Sometimes we think asking someone else shows I don't have wisdom. But the wisest people I know know what they don't know. I know what I don't know. I know what I'm not good at. I know what my strengths are and I know what my weaknesses are. And if I don't know this, why would I pretend to know it so that I come off as looking smart? That's not wise. That's foolish. So if you know this isn't an area that I'm gifted, I'm, I have knowledge, I have understanding, ask someone. Ask counsel. Seek wise counsel, and it will help you. Here's what Solomon wrote in the Proverbs. He says, let the wise listen and add to their learning. Listen to other people, and your wisdom will expand. And let the discerning get guidance. There is a value in listening to someone of saying, hey, I'm in this situation, I'm in this time of my life, I've got this decision to make, and I'm not sure what to do. Now, here's the question you need to ask them. And if you, asking the question is fine, but beyond that, then we have to do something with their answer. But here's a question to ask. What do you think is the wise thing for me to do? See, here's what we don't like. The wise thing for me and the wise thing for you may be different. So don't say to that person, what do you think the wise thing to do is? Because the wise thing for them, if they were in your situation, may be this. But for you in your situation, it may be that. See, it's not a one-size-fits-all. If it's not a moral imperative, there are things that are clear in the Bible. But if it's not, then you have to say, what's the wise thing for me in this moment, in this time of my life? Is, is this the wise thing for me? What do you think? If you were in my shoes, knowing me, knowing what I've been through, what do you think the wise thing for me to do is? Now, oftentimes, when we go to someone for counsel, we're not actually going for counsel. We're going for confirmation. 
We go to them and say, this is what I want to do. Tell me that I should do it. If that's your goal, then you're not going with a heart of humility. You're not going and saying, I want to grow. I want to gain understanding. I want to gain wisdom. What you're doing is you're going and saying, just, just affirm what I've already decided. That's not seeking counsel. Seeking counsel says, hey, I may not do what you say because you may say something that is completely off the wall. But, but regardless of what you say, I'm going to give it great, great, great weight. I'm going to really think about it. And what you should, if your immediate response is, I'm not going to do that, then you pretty much know you went into it not wanting to hear what they had to say. Don't waste their time. Don't waste yours. So now if you're paying the counselor, fine, they'll take your money and, and they don't care. But uh, <laughs> you know, seek wisdom from other people. And then the last thing is this, apply wisdom. You have to apply wisdom. So what that means is great. You've asked God for it and he's given it to you divinely, supernaturally through the spirit of wisdom. He's provided wisdom through his word. He's provided wisdom through the counsel of others and wisdom has come to you. If you don't do anything with it, you're the biggest idiot of all. Think now. I know what I should do. God has shown me what I should do. I have the wisdom to know what to do, but I'm still not gonna do it. That is the definition of insanity. I mean, okay, if someone could go back in time and say, right now, you should buy, 15 years ago, buy Amazon stock. And you say, no, I'm not going to do that. If you know then what you know now, and you still went back and you didn't buy it, can I tell you, what's the matter with you? I mean, come on. Um, so at some point, you have to apply the wisdom that you've received. Here's what it says in the book of Ephesians. It says, be very careful. Take your time. Look into this and make sure. Be very, very careful. Make sure how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Be very careful to apply the wisdom. Take the time to apply the wisdom that you've received to your life. So how do you apply wisdom? So if, if seeking counsel, seeking wisdom from someone else says, what do you think the wise thing for me to do is? Applying wisdom takes everything that God downloads into your heart, everything you read in the scriptures, everything that people advise you, and then you take all that and then you boil it down and you ask yourself this question. Is this, is this, is this the wise thing to do? Is this the wise thing? thing to do. Knowing my life, knowing my circumstances, knowing where I've been and knowing where I want to go. Is this the wise thing to do? Andy Stanley calls this the best question ever because we have a lot of important questions that we need to answer. Should I take the job? Should I say yes? Is she the one? Those are all important questions. Asking the best question ever, is this the wise thing to do? helps you to answer the important questions of life. So in order to answer this question, you have to run it through a filter. And here's the filter. The first thing is this. Is this the wise thing to do in light of your present experiences? I'm sorry, in light of your past experiences. Is this the wise thing to do in light of your past experiences? You have, you have been through things. You know you've been through some trials. You've gone down some trails that you never thought you'd go down. Your life has had some bumps and bruises, and it's left you beat up and hurt and wounded. In light of your past experiences, is this the wise thing to do? Is this the wise thing to do? I'm, I'm wounded. I'm hurt. Disappointed. Is it the best thing to do right now to jump into a relationship? with someone, to end up jumping into a marriage relationship without having had time to find healing and wholeness. Knowing your past, knowing that you could not in the past handle a credit card responsibly, is it the wise thing to do to go into the bank and sign up for another one? Is it the wise thing to do based on your past circumstances? You know your past. You know what you've been through. And you have to have, and be honest. Knowing my past, is this the wise thing to do. But it's not just about your past. It's also about this. The next part of the filter is this. In light of your current circumstances. Okay, I know what I've been through, but I also know where I am right now. I'm a parent with young children at home, 
and my current circumstances, maybe it's not the wise thing to say yes to this right now. I'm in this situation where I know that um, I can't even make my monthly payments and I can't even uh, barely keep my budget afloat. I can just barely keep my head above water. But all your friends are saying, hey, let's go and go out and have a night on the town. <laughs> Is that the wise thing to do based on your current circumstances? Is it the wise thing to do? You are engaged. You are planning to get married. You have everything lined up. And she calls you up out of the blue. The ex of yours. Who you haven't talked to for years. But man, that little flame burns up in your heart. Your current situation, your current circumstances, I'm going to get married in six weeks. Is it the wise thing to do to go out and have an innocent little dinner with my ex? Is it the wise thing to do based on your past experiences, your current circumstances? And the third part of the filter is this, in light of your future hopes and dreams. See, you want to be somewhere. You want to go somewhere. You, li- you want your life to follow a different path moving forward. You know where you want to be financially 10 years from now. You know where you want to be uh, in your career five years from now. You know where you want to be relationally one or two or three years from now. You know what you'd like your life to look like. And you have to ask yourself, will this decision help or hinder that future? I want to be debt free in five years. Well, then does it make sense to go get more debt? Is that the wise thing to do? At this, if, if you want to be debt-free, why would you take on more debt? Is it the wise thing to do? Is it the wise thing to do if you want to have a relationship with your children that is open and honest and transparent and they can come to you with all their things that they're struggling with when they're adults? Is it the wise thing to do to marginalize them, to ignore them, and not invest in them when they're in their formative years and teen years? Is it the wise thing to do? Listen, you know what you want your marriage to look like. Is it the wise thing to do to, I don't know, ignore your spouse? Is it the wise thing to do to talk down to him, to talk down to her, to not show honor and respect and love and gentleness and kindness and say, I, I want to have a great marriage. I don't think you'll get there. Is it the wise thing to do? So, see, so often what we do, the progress that we often use is we look at our lives, we look where we are, and we ask the question, can I do this? Can I afford this? Can I afford the payment? Can I afford um, what is happening? Uh, can I afford... Uh, to uh, get the mortgage? Can I afford whatever it is? So we ask if I can. Can I do this? And we answer the question affirmatively. I can do this. I can do this. So what we do is this. We say, if I can, then I should. If I can afford this, then I should buy it. If I can make the payment, then I should get the car. If I can afford the, the, the mortgage, then I should buy the house. If I can, then I should. But that's not the progression of wisdom. Instead of saying, if I can, then I should, we have to say, is this wise? In other words, if I should, then I will. If I should, then I will. If I should, then I will. If I should do this, if this is the wise thing to do, then I will do it. But if it's not, if I shouldn't do this because it's not wise, then I won't. It doesn't matter if I can or I can't. It matters if I should because is this the wise thing to do? Is this the wise thing to do? In light of, in light of, in light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams. Just because I can doesn't mean that I should. So let me share an example from my life. About seven years ago. So I had been here at Hickory Ridge as a pastor uh, for just a little over, not quite a year. It was probably um, around April, uh, and I started here in June, late June. So it wasn't quite a year. And I get a phone call from a church. And uh, they said, "Um, we had gotten your resume back a a while while ago. And uh, we thought we had hired someone. And it didn't work out. And we got this opportunity. Are you interested? (laughs) I said, well, remind me about your church. It's been a while. 
And they said, oh, you know, we're down in, in this metropolitan area, and it was a larger church, much larger budget, much different place to live than, than Sussex County. <laughs> Listen, it would, can I have applied for that job? Can I have said, yeah, let's talk more? Just because I can doesn't mean I should. But I stepped back, and I said, in light of my past experiences, what I went through, the pain, the anguish, the way I was treated at a previous church before I got here. Does it make sense for me to jump into something else when this church here has shown love, compassion, embraced me and my family, helped, helped us to find another level of healing and wholeness? In, in light of my current circumstances, here I am, my kids have, have developed some friendships my, my two youngest had, had developed some great friendships very quickly, and my, my oldest daughter was, was here and, and looking for her future. And, and I said, in my current circumstances, is this what I want? And for my future, what am I hoping for? What am I dreaming for? We had met as a leadership team. We put a vision in place. We said, this is what we see the next four, five, six, seven years looking like. In light of what I want the future to look like, is this the right thing? Is this the wise thing to do? Just because I can doesn't mean that I should, and if I shouldn't, then I won't, and if I should, then I will. And so it was relatively easy for me to say, um, no, thank you, I appreciate you reaching out to me, but um, I'm not the guy for you right now. And we went on. And thank God, look at where we are now, and I'm so grateful that I've been here for almost eight years, and I wouldn't trade that for anything. But if I had just said I can, I should. See, what happens is we look at it and say, if I can, then I should, and I will. And if I should, instead of saying, if I should, then I will. So we don't ask that wisdom. The other thing that we often ask ourselves is the right or wrong question. We want to make everything a, a moral uh, dictate. We want to assign moral value to things. So we have a decision to make, and what we ask is, is this right or wrong? Is it good or bad. We don't ask, is this wise or unwise? Because if we make it a moral dictate, what happens is we can find ourselves in this morally gray area. Because there are a lot of things that aren't right or wrong, good or bad, but they are wise or unwise. And so we end up doing this thing called justification or rationalization. So we say to ourselves, is it right or wrong? Is it good or bad? We don't ask, is it wise or unwise? So we, we justify it. It's my cheat day. So I'm going to eat the whole cake. <laughs> I've been really stressed. I just need to unwind. So I'll have the drink. You know, I don't want to come across as a jerk, as unkind, as rude, as insensitive, so I'll return the phone call to that unhealthy ex who keeps pestering me because it's the nice thing to do. Listen, you can be nice and unwise. Don't throw out being nice, but add to being nice wisdom. You can be caring. You can care for the poor and be unwise and get taken advantage of. Don't, give up, don't throw away being caring. Add to caring being wise. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Let me, let me walk you through what this could look like. The, is this good? Is this bad? Is this right? Is this wrong scenario? So let's imagine you had been in a long-term relationship and the other person breaks it off. You don't know why. They don't really give you an explanation. They might give you the old, it's, it's, you, it's me, it's not you, but you don't really know what that means. And all you know is your heart is crushed and you're in your pain you're feeling rejected, but you're single, and you want to just go out and have a good time and unwind and relax and socialize. You're in your uh, stage of life. You don't have kids at home. You don't have any of those things, and you go, I just want to, want to go and, and enjoy myself. So you go out, and you're, you're out, and you meet someone, and they start paying attention to you and asking you questions about yourself, and all of a sudden, you feel good. It makes you feel loved, cared for, important. Let me ask you a question. Have you done anything wrong? No. Is that right or wrong? It's not right or wrong. It's not good or bad. Is it wise or is it unwise? Based on your past experience and your current circumstance, knowing that you're vulnerable emotionally, is this the wise thing to do? 
But you say, is this right or wrong? Not wrong. I'm single. I can talk to anyone I want. So you continue. You give the person your number and you start texting that night and over the next number of days and, and you just keep texting and you all of a sudden go, this person gets me. I mean, they get me. I can share things. I can open up. I can be vulnerable. I can be real. You start talking about feelings of rejection, feelings of loneliness, feelings of isolation. And you're like, they get me. Now, let me just tell you, of course they get you. All you're doing is talking. All they're doing is listening. Of course they get you. All they have to do is affirm you. Oh, I can imagine how much that hurt. So of course they get you. But again, let me ask you a question. Is this right or wrong? It's not wrong. You're having a conversation. Text, in person, it doesn't matter. You're connecting with someone. There's nothing wrong with that. There's, nothing, there's no morally wrong area there. So you continue, but you end up, you see, your decisions are leading you down a path. And so as the relationship continues and you spend more time together and all of a sudden you find out that they're not a Christian or they're not really a committed, sold out, on fire, fully devoted follower of Jesus. They might have some Christian something sometime back in the past, but they know enough that the, the, when they know what the Bible is. But at this point, your heart has now been given to them. You know they're not who they, they don't share the same values, the same ideals. But, you know, I care about them. And so what happens is you know now, the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked. Don't be in a relationship with someone, a deep, intimate, personal relationship. Friends is one thing, but don't be in that kind of relationship with someone who's not a Christian. So you know this is wrong. Now this isn't this morally gray area, but you start the rationalization. I can help them get closer to Jesus. Or you pull one of these. Listen, God, God wanted us to be together. Why else would our paths have crossed? He must be leading us somewhere. And so you make choices and decisions and attitudes and actions that are not always wrong, but they lead you somewhere until you begin to rationalize a wrong decision. Because you made a series of unwise choices. And you know what happens next. You end up waking up in their bed. You end up with an STD. You end up with an unplanned pregnancy. Or maybe none of those things. You just end up married and in a miserable relationship because you're not, um, you're not copacetic spiritually. You're not at the same place. You're unbalanced. And you want one thing spiritually and they want something else. Or they're abusive or they're dismissive. And all of a sudden, all they're getting you, all they're caring about you, all their understanding of you seems to go out the window. And what you say is, how did I get here? You got there because you asked, is this right or is this wrong? Is this good or is this bad? How close to the moral line can I get? Instead of asking, is this wise or is this unwise? And if you had asked that question, you could have saved yourself a mountain of regret. So you have to step back and say, in light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, and what I want for my future, is this the wise thing to do? So I'm going to ask if you'd stand to your feet. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Where in your life are you playing the it's not wrong game? It's not wrong. I mean, it's, it's not wrong. It's not bad. Where are you playing that? Is it texting someone that's not your spouse? That's a member of the opposite sex? And it's not wrong, but you don't let your spouse see those texts. They don't know anything about this person. They don't know, and you'd be embarrassed if they did. You'd feel guilty. Where are you playing the it's not wrong game? It's... it's it's not wrong for me to get that credit card, but is it the wise thing to do based on your past experiences, your current circumstances, and your future hopes and dreams? It's not wrong for me to stop and get a drink on the way home from work. Is it the wise thing to do based on your past experiences, your current circumstances, and your future hopes and dreams? You have to answer those questions. But if you won't, You'll never break out of the ordinary life and live the extraordinary, unordinary life that God wants for you. And it starts when you choose wisdom. 
So many of us fail to live that unordinary life because we fail to ask God for wisdom, receive wisdom from parents, friends, pastors, coworkers, neighbors. It's why I tell people, be in a small group, be in a connect group. There are people there that can speak wisdom into your life. They'll help you. You have to learn to receive wisdom and then apply it. Apply wisdom. So here's what I want you to walk away with. Remember this, choose wisdom, choose wisdom, choose wisdom. You will never regret it. Choose wisdom every time. Choose wisdom often and early. Choose wisdom over and over and over and over and over again. If every time you have a decision to make, you ask yourself, is this the wise thing to do in light of my past experiences, my current circumstances, and my future hopes and dreams? If you do that, you can break out of the mold of the ordinary and live an unordinary life. So I'm going to ask if you close your eyes, just begin to pray. Just begin to pray. Ask God, God, do I, do I need wisdom? Do I need more wisdom? Do I need greater wisdom? Where do I lack wisdom in my life? Where do I need that? Where are those places that I'm playing that it's not right, it's not wrong game, it's good, it's not bad game? Where am I doing that? And I'm not making the wise choice. I'm not asking, is this wise or unwise? Just ask him to show you. As you pray, I just want to say something. For some of you, the, the place where wisdom starts is when you make the most important, the wisest choice you can make, which is to place your life in the hands of Jesus Christ. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, that is the greatest choice you could ever make. It's the wisest decision you could ever make. The Bible tells us that if you place your, hand, your life in the hands of God, nothing, 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 nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. It is the safest, wisest decision you can make. And you might be thinking right now, I've made a lot of bad choices. I've made a lot of unwise decisions and my life has gone down a path and a trail and led to a destination that I never thought I could get to and I never wanted to get to and I find myself living in. But if you're here this morning, if you're joining us online, here's the wonderful good news. If you call on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. If you say, God, forgive me, and you make this wisest choice, your life will begin to start a new course in a new direction. It might not get fixed overnight, but you will start to see God move in a new way. So if you've never placed your life in, in the hands of Jesus, if you've never asked for him to be your Lord and your Savior, you've never asked him to forgive you of your sins from living from your own wisdom and accept the wisdom from above, and right where you are, just raise your hand. If you're joining us online, click the button that says, I'm raising my hand. I'm giving my life to Jesus. And now if everyone here, whether you're raising your hand or not, if you would repeat this prayer after me, Heavenly Father, I come to you now. And I ask you to forgive me. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me for living in my own wisdom. My own understanding. I lay down my life. And I receive new life in Christ. Fill me with your spirit. The spirit of wisdom. Give me understanding. Allow me to live for you. To walk a new path. And live a new life. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you pray that prayer, you're part of God's family. If you're joining us online, click the button that says, I, I made this commitment. We want to follow up with you. But now, I just want to pray for all of you. We all need wisdom. And so before we sing this last song, I want to pray a prayer over you. So if you just close your eyes and you think about that area where you need wisdom. Now, God, speak. Speak right now to each one of us. God, just like you spoke to Solomon thousands of years ago, ask me anything. Ask me anything and I'll give it to you. God, would right now the cry of our heart be, give me wisdom in this area. Give me wisdom for this decision. Give me wisdom how to handle this situation. Give me wisdom in how to navigate this relationship. Give me wisdom on how to deal with my finances. Give me wisdom on how to parent my children. Whatever it is, wherever that greatest need of wisdom is for you, right now, just begin to say it. 
Say it in your own thoughts. Say it in your own mind. Say it out loud if you want. God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom as a husband. Give me wisdom as a father. Give me wisdom as a pastor. Give me wisdom as a business leader. Give me wisdom as a teacher. Give me wisdom as a mother. Give me wisdom as a wife. Give me wisdom as a grandparent. Give me wisdom as a brother or a sister. Give me wisdom as a child, how to honor and respect my parents. God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. Oh God, if you'll give us that wisdom, and you said you would, if you'll give us that wisdom, and we'll begin to apply it, and we'll work on that heart form. God, I believe that each one of us in the years to come will look back and say, look where my life is. And it's only, only, only because I chose wisdom. So God, help us to choose wisdom every time, every time, every time, so that we will never have to live with a mountain of regrets. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen. Now let's worship God together.